Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with Piers Secunda, an accomplished artist and a sculptor with a difference. Piers, good to see you. Thank you very much, you too. And um, we've got a few things to get through today because um, you are an artist with a difference, aren't you? Um, you started your training... <laughs> You started your training at the Chelsea College of Art, and um, presumably that was an all-round experience, was it? Um, to, to a degree. I mean, by the time I got to Chelsea Art College, I knew exactly what I wanted to study, which was painting. Um, the Previous to the degree or prior to the degree, um, I did a foundation course, which is necessary to get on to a, 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 an art degree, a specialist art degree. And at the foundation course, um, you study everything for a brief time, photography, animation, film, uh, textiles, design, fashion design, uh, printmaking, uh, et cetera. And then you specialize. So by the time I was in the degree course, I was just doing painting. So how did the sculpture bit come into it? Well, I'd been drawing and painting since I was a child. Yeah. Um, and by the time I had reached 18 years old, and, and left school and wanted to go into art college, I decided that I had a problem with the traditions of painting. And the problem, in a nutshell, what I realized the problem was, was that um, I didn't like the constraints of the 2D surface that you right. traditionally paint onto. If you think about the history of painting from cave painting to the present day, it largely revolves around the application of color to a flat surface. Mm. But I didn't like the fact that when I got to the edges of that flat surface that I had to stop that there was a physical constraint to what the painting could be. And what I really wanted was a system of painting uh, which would um, it be extendable in any direction. And the way I found uh, into this process or this idea um, was uh, to use paint as a sculptural material. If I was making objects with paint and they were only made out of paint, I was still painting but not in the traditional sense. And I was effectively, in my mind at least, expanding on the traditions of painting and taking it somewhere a little bit different. So so essentially you're putting surface upon surface upon surface. Is that right? Well, basically, what I, ultimately what I was doing was predominantly casting with paint. So it was, it was a sculptural technique, but using paint. So um, because the primary material, my logic was that the, because the primary material was was only paint I was still painting and dealing with paint in a different way which is what painting is um so what I was doing in casting was was making forms where the exterior surface was what mattered yeah so I was describing the real world which is the tradition of painting but using uh casting and and uh, uh sculpting largely sculpting techniques breaking the paint with a hammer and chisel um sawing it drilling it um, heating it up and tearing it, all sorts of different techniques. And what sort of paint is it that you're using? Is it? It's an industrial floor paint. Okay. It's called a non non solvent epoxy floor paint. All right. So okay. It's, um, it's it's kind of low uh, low toxicity, doesn't produce fumes, and um, it cures chemically. So the the deeper it's poured, the faster it cures. Right, uh, which was an incredible thing for me because previously I'd been using acrylic, and if I poured a four-inch thick layer of acrylic, it'd take two months to dry, and it would shrink a lot because acrylic has a lot of water in it that had to evaporate for the paint to go hard, and that would take months, and then I would end up with an in inaccurate reproduction of the interior of a mold because the paint shrunk so much. Uh, imagine like a um, an apple if you put plaster around an apple. And then six months later, after it's shrunken and shriveled up inside, open it up and, you know, the apple doesn't look like what it used to, you know. So then that was a disappointment, you know. So the industrial paint was great because I pour it into the mold. If it separated from the mold in shrinkage terms, even a millimeter, um, it was something that kind of gone wrong. Um, and the following day, I would open up the mold and it would be completely solid, completely cured. Um, and I'd made an object effectively overnight, and then I could make another one again. So that was a revelation. How did you discover it, though, Piers? Did you, you know, was it just luck, or 
did you go down to your local uh, do-it-yourself centre and say, have you got anything that's really thick in the way of paint? Well, a little bit, yeah. So I saw some guys painting lines on the road mm. in London. I said, well, what is this paint? How does this work? And they showed me pellets of plastic, which are melted down to make the yeah. lines on the road. Yeah. Thought, oh, well, that's not paint. Um, so then I started, and they said, one of them said, oh, you, you need to speak to a guy um, called uh, Jonathan at a company called Dixotech Paints. And so I looked that up. That's fairly early days of the internet, but you know, you could, you could, you know, it was it was possible to start to find people. Yeah. You know, and if you put in a company name, there might be a sort of weird sort of homemade website, um, you know, with with an animation of somebody, you know, stirring a pot of paint or something ridiculous, you know, and then a phone number and nothing else. I think he had a website that was sort of like that, you know, and just a phone number. So I called him and I said, "This is what I'm trying to do," and he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I can help you." Um, and he sold me this this product. And the first time I tried to use it, I didn't I didn't mix it sufficiently. And so it sort of came out rubbery. And I said, well, this is no good. It's all rubbery. And he said, oh, you've mixed it wrong. You have to mix it for 20 minutes. And I thought, oh, right. I kind of wasted a lot of my life mixing paint in the future, but let's give it a go. So we bought another can of it, mixed it up, and, and it went hard so fast that the stirring object, which I'd used, solidified. it solidified around <laughs> it. And I could pick up the pot of paint with, the, with this stick, this flat piece of wood, and I thought, this is it. This is the business. <laughs> it was a eureka moment, you know. So did you keep that piece of art? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a technical error. It went and been pretty fast. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, having sort of done a bit of an investigation on your website, there are certain uh, uh, sections in there that I'd like you to tell me a little bit more, um, if you could. Uh, first one was cultural destruction stroke shop works. What's that all about? So um, I was living in northern New York in the Hudson Valley, which is about two and a half hours from New York City to the north of New York City, um, between 99 and 2003. And uh, in 2001, uh, the, uh, in the spring of 2001, Taliban destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. thousand year old uh, Buddhist monumental Buddhist sculptures, which are carved into cliffs in Bamiyan province. And uh, everyone in the Western world saw the film footage of those sculptures being dynamited um, by the Taliban. And uh, it was very, very big news. And it was a sort of um, extraordinary uh, shockwave. Uh, it, it hit me very hard. Mm. Uh, I couldn't really understand why somebody or an organization would believe that destroying ancient culture um, would improve the quality of the lives of the people around uh, around that place. Um, in, in many respects, as to a lot of people, it still defies logic completely. Um, they lost the tourist industry in that region, which a lot of people were totally dependent upon. Um, so I, I, it was very hard in 2001 to get information you could formative years, embryonic, I suppose, years of the, of the internet. Mm. And uh, you, you couldn't really find in-depth searching, um, uh, reporting on something like that. Um, and, and it stuck in my head in a very assertive way. Um, also bear in mind, you know, growing up in London and in London in the 80s and, and 90s, there's a lot of terrorist activity going on. I was aware that violence was something that could come into your neighbourhood. Yeah. You know? And then all of a sudden, sort of looking at that on the television, trying to understand what it meant. Mm. And six months later, 9-11 happened. Um, and there was a sort of paradigm shift in my practice, which happened over a few years. But immediately I started to adjust in my, in my mind and my, my emotional approach to painting uh, away from abstraction and towards making art which um, examined the nature of geopolitics and especially the destruction of culture. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this, this is sort of shift away from dealing with comparative aesthetics in my work and, and more assertively focusing on what I perceived as the thing that mattered overwhelmingly to me, which was uh, why this was happening and um, how I could uh, effectively comment on it yeah. Uh, in work. 
Okay. Uh, what about assemblage? What does that uh, entail? Well, the assemblages were the sculptures which I was making out of the industrial floor paint uh, in between discovering the material, which was in uh, 2003, um, and uh, being fully committed in everything that I was making to uh, producing art about geopolitics, which was around, I think around about 2007, I was two thirds of the way there. The work in, in its respect to uh, geopolitics was slight, slightly subtle. The work still looked fairly abstract. There were some far more figurative elements than there had been in the last couple of years prior. But by 2007, I put together a pretty substantial exhibition um, in a gallery in East London. And although some people actually bought the works in that exhibition, quite a few of them, actually two thirds or three quarters of the work in the exhibition got sold, it wasn't inherently clear by looking at the work what it was about. Mm. Uh, but the majority of the work in that exhibition was uh, was actually about uh, the, the physical remnants of um, violent politics, yeah. uh, especially in Europe. So Spanish train bombings, uh, the um, 77 bombings in London, Tower Stock Square bus bombing, for example. Uh, but it wasn't inherently obvious by looking at the work what the connection was, but there was something... Um, physically kind of foreboding about the work and, and that's the element that was introduced to them so those were the assemblages gotcha um you also uh use crude oil as a medium yeah that's right yeah uh, for quite a long time um in 2009 i, I uh, went to shanghai and i did a residency in shanghai and um, i was trying to find a material which i could utilize as though it was paint and would function as paint if I treated it in a necessary way and uh, which I could apply to the work and which would carry effectively the baggage of the noise of uh, the the active um, uh, post-industrial internet age uh, yeah. into into the work and 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 by its physical presence um, bringing in um the, the type of noise that occurs in the world on, on a daily basis outside the little bubble of the studio, the kind of um, emotional and mental bubble which you go into in a studio, you're in your own little world, a little cocoon. Mm. Um, and it was the noise outside that window, the rest of the world that somehow I wanted to bring in and I, had, I needed to find some sort of emblematic material um, that could do that. And the, and the presence of crude oil in the work uh, enabled that. And so that, that sort of took the work in a new direction, I suppose you could say. It's um, pretty a uh, pretty gungy material, isn't it? I mean, probably it, almost it can, as bad as the lots, floor paint. <laughs> well, I mean, it can, it can be lots of different things. I wanted yeah. it to, to have the consistency effectively of toothpaste right? so that I could salt screen with it. So it had to be quite gelatinous. I had to figure out ways to make this fluid um, in, into that sort of uh, texture. And that wasn't necessarily easy because some crude oil is... Is very thick, paste-like already, uh, but it won't cure. It'll just stay wet indefinitely, and it stinks. You yeah. know, it's yeah. you can't really present that in a gallery or um, or, or kind of offer it to sale uh, for sale to somebody. Um, so I had to meddle with it. And my work and my studio practice have always been a primitive alchemy. Um, I make notes about experiments that I've done. I'll try ten different processes or systems to make a particular thing. One of them will be better than the rest, and then that's what I'll roll with. And the crude oil was a similar thing, but it was very fast because I realized that if I mixed um, an oil-based varnish with the crude oil, so long as the crude oil was thick enough that it could take the varnish, um, that it would uh, work and I could make brush marks with it with a paintbrush or I could print with it. Um, so sometimes, for example, crude oil is, has a consistency of, of WD-40. Mm. The, the aerosol uh, lubricant yeah and that stuff if you were to spray that say into an edge of uh two objects like say where a window pane touches a window frame it would do it has a quality which is known as uh, um, creeping which is that it will seep along an edge it will travel along an edge and find its way down an edge or or a little crack or something like that and some crude oils of that liquid and that fluid and that kind of greasy 
And what I really wanted, like I said, is, is for it to behave a lot more like toothpaste. Yeah. So I had to find ways to reduce the solvents uh, in, in the oil, the liquids. Um, effectively, the way I did that was to put it in a in a little camp stove um, cooker, a little pot, um, and warm it up for about an hour or so. Um, and it would reduce quite a bit and become very, very viscous. And that's that's the way I moved. S- silly question. How do you actually well, purchase crude oil? It's actually not a silly question. Very good question. And the reason is you can open a, a trading account mm-hmm. and buy X numbers of barrels of crude yeah. oil. Yeah. And, and you know, it shows up in a in a kind of digital wallet. And there it is on your screen, and you can log in, and you can go, yes, there it is. I own it. Don't actually own it. Um, physically getting hold of it is a huge challenge. Mm. Um, there are all sorts of laws which restrict how it's moved. Um, but I discovered by looking on eBay that people sell what are known as specimen samples of crude oil. All right. And they're tiny, tiny little bottles. They might be the length of your thumb, but maybe sometimes a little bit bigger. And uh, they'll be labelled. And often what happens is that um, the oil industry will generate specimen samples that are sent to a laboratory and tested yeah. so that um, uh, an oil exploration project knows how to, uh, they know what they found and how to market it. They'll say, you know, this is particularly good for fuel, this is particularly good for lubricants, yeah. whatever, whatever it might be. Um, they'll get a sort of compound breakdown chemical breakdown all full analysis and then these specimen samples just sort of sit around um it's quite hard material to get rid of so i found a fellow up in canada who had worked in a a laboratory testing specimen samples for decades and he had hundreds and hundreds of bottles and so i emailed him i I met him over ebay ebay because he was selling these things on ebay Mm. Uh, and as long as you transport them by ground transport and not in aeroplanes, um, everything's okay. Um, so you just sort of pay for FedEx or UPS ground transport. And, um, you know, they'd show up a couple of weeks later. And, and that worked very well. Um, I remember once emailing him saying, can I buy some Iraqi crude oil? And he said, you've got to be much more specific. Do you want light, medium light, heavy, light, sweet? Basra crude, and he listed about 30 different crude oils from, from Iraq. And I suddenly realized, oh, this is like vintage wines. Yeah. The, the next section of land over has something completely different. So I started asking only for heavy, um, maximum heavy, the most heavy, uh, in other words, the most dense and yeah. viscous mm. of all the crude oils that I wanted. But mm. it, it did take a long time to kind of find it. Some of them I looked for them for two years before I found what I wanted. Incredible. Um, you seem to me to have embraced technology very well in terms of ex- exhibitions. And uh, I noticed, for example, QR codes offers a chance to listen to you on the individual pieces. Um, that's right. That, that, that's that, relatively that, new. Yeah, relatively new. Yeah, um, that's clever. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, my godson says I'm a Luddite. And I keep reminding him I have two telephones, yep. two email addresses, a website, about four outlets for social media. I can't possibly be a Luddite, can I? I don't. Um, so it's really that. nice to hear somebody say, <laughs> you, you, you know, in, in embrace technology. Um, <laughs> the QR codes, the idea with the QR codes was that at the time that I first used them, I was making a drawing with charcoal. Mm. Charcoal is the first material of mark making in human history, followed shortly afterwards by some pigment, yeah. um, which was just presumably just found on the ground, highly unlikely that it was processed in any way. Um, but charcoal drawings, some charcoal drawings go back 60 plus, 60,000 plus years. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going to places where things, works of art, artifacts, uh, buildings, uh, repositories for culture, museums, uh, libraries, etc., cetera, um, have been burned, and this charcoal, and I'm gathering up charcoal and I'm making inks out of it and drawing yeah. with it, um, is there a way to create a QR code? Can I draw a QR code with charcoal no. um, in such a way that it works and it takes you, the charcoal becomes a portal to um, the, through the internet age directly to my voice and through the 
all this material or not, you can you can hear my uh, you know you can use this enhanced technology and you can hear my. So you actually voice. you're actually drawing the QR code each time. I, I did I did manage to draw one with a stencil. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I couldn't. It, it was quite large. It was way too big. I can imagine. Thing. Yeah. I, I actually ended up giving again making an ink. I make a lot of inks, so um, I made some ink with um, Ukrainian charcoal mixed with a, a printing medium. Um, and I had a fellow in my studio building silk screen uh, a two centimeter by two centimeter charcoal QR code into the corner of the of the piece of paper. He yeah. gave me three of them, and then I set to work making the drawing. I only needed one because I got drawing right first time, thankfully. But and that was the beginning. Yeah, you've 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 done a lot of projects. How do you fund the projects? You, do you get you know commercial sponsorship or anything like that? Uh, occasionally, this uh, government funding. For example, I made a, a commission for the Ashmolean Museum mm. a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and um, that commission was in part paid for by uh, an Arts Council grant, um, and that was that was largely possible because the Ashmolean received so many visitors that we were able to say X thousand people yes. will be in the building at that time will see this, yeah. and therefore they can justify um, providing some funding, um, and then. Um, I did some uh, private funding for that where I reached out to or got in touch with uh, a couple of dozen people who own work of mine and said that it's a very important moment for me to be able to do this project. And, you know, we're creating what we called a, um, a funding circle, a supporters circle, and people contributed uh, 500 pounds or something to that effect. And yeah. I think somebody gave us a thousand uh, in exchange for which they received an addition uh, as, as a form of thank you after mm. the exhibition was over. Um, so it's it's a combination of um, public and private funding, um, predominantly it's private. Um, sometimes it's sales of works. If, if I make a decent sized sale of a work, um, you know, that goes first off. ISIS works, for example, create charitable contributions. So that happens first and then money goes into the pot. That, that uh, particular one uh, sounded very interesting. Mesopotamia to Iraq. So you're yeah, going, that was going back a long way in history on that. Absolutely. Well, the purpose of the exhibition, that's the Ashmolean exhibition in Mesopotamia, mm. from Mesopotamia to Iraq. And, this, and the point of the exhibition was to explain how the, the region, the Mesopotamian region, which is uh, covers the, the land which is now modern-day Iraq, before it had borders yeah. drawn by French and um, British um, pith helmet-wearing uh, probably safari suited guys with red crayons leaning over a map um, and to condense it into its most basic and cartoonish description and um, how the nation state came into existence and and what the, the the political push and pull of the people involved was and ultimately who won mm. who won by uh, receiving that and who lost um, which was predominantly the Kurds who were the largest ethnicity in the world without a nation yeah. Um, and uh, how it all occurred. And then to bring the story to the present day, because that story uh, revolves around um, the years following uh, the end of the First World War and when the nation state of Iraq was created, to bring it to the present day in a very, what I thought was still a thing, extremely progressive move. The curator, who's, whose name is Paul Collins, he's now the head of uh, Middle East or keeper of Middle East art at the British Museum, uh, started that position this year mm. um he said well let's put a large installation of my work into the exhibition and uh, we will show by doing that a big isis installation isis related installation um, smashed looks like smashed sculpture uh, around about 2000 objects um, by doing that we will bring the story of the development from mesopotamia to iraq up to the present day because we can draw a clear line through the developments and changes in politics from the creation of Iraq to the existence of ISIS. Coming over to Alderney now, um, you were over here and you did some work here and uh, established that um, the bullet holes at the gravel works, as we call it, um, uh, were basically an execution area nearly 80 years on. But I found it interesting to note that... Um, you use cordite as a material, and yeah. you'd you'd actually found b 
bits of cool cool diet on site is that correct um on the island yeah, yeah. um i'm i'm not going to tell you who gave the cordite to me because i don't want to create a problem for that individual but i was given a fairly decent volume of it um but it had been burned before it was handed over to me yeah um, because i made it clear that i didn't want to get onto an aeroplane uh, with it i was going to give a very very small i mean and uh, you could put the, the volume into a matchbox mm -hmm. by somebody else mm. and then i realized it may be possible to get a larger volume of this he he couldn't get it for me and didn't want to um but yeah. the cordite that i was originally given given was in its raw form which is an explosive obviously yeah. gunpowder sort of that. thing yeah yeah but compressed into a solid lump yeah uh, it looked like a, a clot of earth, but it was extremely hard, very, very dry, pale brown, um, grayish brown. Anyway, um, I broke that into a few pieces and burned it and ground it down with a mortar and pestle. And I thought, this is fantastic. This is this is a material which I can use to make uh, prints. So um, I spoke to enough people on Alderney that somebody put their hand up and volunteered to give it to me. And there was an arrangement that um, that I wouldn't, let on who it was no fair enough yeah so um, yeah the, the, the cordite was turned into an ink and that ink was used to silk screen images uh pictures um of alderney and the documents and um some historic images uh, and, and, and we're talking about a material that was 80 years old yep yeah yep. i mean it, it's, 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 it's the genuine yep. stuff it's yeah the, yeah and it just just seems incredible that it's still around, as it were. But there yeah, we are. Well, you know, I mean, if you uh, for about three or four years, I kept every newspaper article that I stumbled upon. Yeah, which described the the finding of um, unexploded ordnance um, from World War Two. Yeah, uh, and it's it happened so often that after I had about fifteen or twenty of these articles. I was keeping them in an envelope and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do with these, but I thought there might be something in it if I kept them. And I still got them in an envelope. But over the course of a few years, I was even on the train once to from London to Ramsgate and the train was stopped. Everybody was told to get on the platform and the train back, went back the other way. And we were told it's because further up the line, um, somebody who was digging in an, in an allotment had had unearthed a World War, unexploded World War II bomb mm. uh, and the train couldn't continue down the track. Mm. You know, this stuff happens frequently. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's just really a, a continuation of that. Now, yeah. you've you've received a lot of acclamation by the quality media. Um, right. Which, it, you know, you must be very pleased to get that in terms of the fact that it is a recognition of your work, isn't it? I suppose it is. Yeah, ultimately, I suppose it is. Um, it was incredibly helpful in, in terms of getting... The story about the exhibition, the Alderney exhibition, which was titled Alderney, the Holocaust on British Soil, yeah. out into the world and uh, into the, you know, uh, under the noses of people who were reading newspapers and 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 potentially engaged and interested and wanted to know. Um, so the Times, the Telegraph and the Guardian all reviewed the exhibition in the first few days. So it was extremely helpful um, and considerable numbers, numbers of people came to the exhibition. As a result, and when people walk through the door, um, if if they started talking to me and were interested enough in what they were seeing to, to have a discussion, I always asked, you know, how did you find out about the exhibition? Oh, I read it in the Guardian, the Telegraph, or Times. Yeah, so yeah, that was that was good. Problem. That's good. Um, and 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 to that end, the Alderney exhibition is currently stored, or what? It's currently in my flat. Right. It occupies a very small space, but it, it does need to be transferred to my studio. Yeah. Um, it's a little, slightly more convenient storage, but it, it occupies a very small space. Um, and the hope and aim with the exhibition is that um, it gets packaged up into a crate uh, and it travels. Yeah, sure. And yeah. where it goes is, is a matter of um, who's able to take it, you know, who's able to receive it and yeah. present it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. What's your next project? Next project? Well, I'm working on an exhibition, uh, what ultimately will be an exhibition of uh, drawings which are going to be made with tar, scraped off 3,000-year-old sculptures from 
Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Wow. Um, they tell Halaf sculptures that come from modern day Syria. And um, the reason I'm interested in these sculptures is because every uh, aspect of uh, the, uh, the story of restitution, the experience of uh, something which the museum world tussles with on, a, on an hourly basis nowadays, um, whether or not to restitute objects back to the places from whence they came, where they yeah. were created, even if those places um, as hemispheres are now divided up by modern day borders and with complicated politics, um, things are, are often sent back to the places where they came from. And that's the process of restitution. And so um, the, all of the discussions surrounding restitution, conservation, destruction, um, whether the presence of these objects in the countries that they're in is legal or not, and what it means uh, for governments and for museums uh, in, in you know, the 2020s to have all these things uh, are bound up in the story of the Tel Halaf sculptures. So the works will uh, portray the discovery and then multiple destructions of the Tel Halaf sculptures, thus some damage World War I, then almost total destruction in World War II, uh, reconstruction very recently um, by the Pergamon Museum, uh, and then side stories like the fact that the Metropolitan Museum in New York have some of these Tel Aviv sculptures and how they came to be in their hands, which is very peculiar, sort of seizure by American government start of World War II because they were German uh, mm. owned, and then the Met was allowed by the American government to buy them. Is that even uh, morally viable or, or reasonable to, to have happened, etc. So it, all of these sort of narratives bound up in, in these stories with QR codes and forms, of course. Yeah, so back to the Elgin Marbles. Elgin Marbles, yeah. Well, That's a classic that's one, isn't it? Well, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, just to conclude, what do you feel about wokeism's involvement with art and specifically the Tate and why Britain, uh, why Tate Britain should drop the pol political posturing and allow its collection to speak for itself. You know, do you really think there's a there should be undue influence from people as to what art is all about, or should um, it speak art, for itself? Well, ultimately, artists art is about what artists want it to be about. Sure. So, if there's a a, a sort of uh, shift in thinking over the course of time and um, artists' approaches start to come from a different position, um, then that's what the art is about. Um, yeah. And um, whether um, one person over here subscribes to it, another person over here doesn't, um, is ultimately their decision. Yeah. This person's, this person's. Um, but often the artist finds themselves in the middle um, because they make work about what interests them and increasingly because uh, the social content of art is becoming an increasingly um, leading uh, element to why people make art and what they make art about uh, and what it's ultimately what I'm saying I suppose is that what artists feel is important to them and what's happening around them becomes content for their work so um, it, it's really up to artists uh, you know, to make art about what they feel is relevant. And, yeah. uh, you know, people will always make judgments and, and some people will say, this is just terrible. And some people say, this is just perfect. Uh, and, and that's always been the case. Um, as long as there's been um, money in the art world um, and pressure to do certain things and not other things, uh, this balancing act has always existed and it always will. Mm -hmm. Piers, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for sparing us some time. Uh, ladies well. and gentlemen, he's actually in New York City and the, the video links worked. Yeah, amazingly. <laughs> Delighted. It's, it's, the, it's the furthest one so far, Piers. Very many, good. many, Thank many you. thanks. Can I wish you all the best for the future and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you very much, Tony. All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye. Just two ticks.